Okay, Alex. So first of all, thank you for finding the time uh, to meet with me and go over the over the questions. So, okay. so the first question is about there are many employment websites like LinkedIn, Indeed, Glassdoor. Which do, which one do you believe are most beneficial? So I, I don't think there's one that's necessarily more beneficial than the other because different companies post on different sites. So you want to be checking all of them to make sure you're getting the full landscape of what jobs are available. Now, one thing that I use when I direct people to do some job searching is I use Google Jobs. I think it's really helpful because it pulls a lot of those sites into one place um, and a lot of sites that you've never even heard before uh, where people can go to post jobs into one place. The one pl the one site that it does not include, I believe, is either Career Builder or Indeed. So you want to be checking those as well. The challenge with Google Jobs, sorry, I'm losing my voice, <clears throat> is that they don't necessarily update the postings. Um, so you might see a posting that's available that has been up there for you know 36 days and might not be live anymore. Uh, so I would follow the links all the way through to the career site if you can to make sure the job is actually still posted before you waste your time applying via that link, because that could be, um, you know, a, a wasted amount of time for you. So, so, so would you recommend that actually uh, once someone finds a job, let's say they find it on Indeed or Google Jobs, uh, would you recommend them, hey, go to the company career site? make sure that the job is actually posted there because that might be the most reliable source. Yes, the company site is always the most reliable. So whenever you can apply directly on there, I encourage it. Okay. Uh, the, the next question is, you know, it's, it's somewhat similar. Uh, so is Indeed or LinkedIn a better resource when uh, job hunting? It depends on the job. Um, there, some are used, some, industries use LinkedIn more heavily and some do not. So like if you're looking for more manufacturing type jobs, um, mm -hmm. for example, or industrial jobs, they likely won't be using LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. They just don't tend to be on that site very often. Um, if you're looking for like a marketing agency or you know the PNGs of the world, they'll likely gravitate mm -hmm. more towards um, LinkedIn. So that's why I would go back to the same answer of if you're really scouring for as many opportunities as you can get your hands on, I would be checking across multiple sites. Yep. And, and I think that you know, for most, most of our students who are business students, I think that most of them are going to be looking for companies that uh, most likely are on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So from time to time, you know, we do, we do ask our students to, you know, to be active on LinkedIn as early as possible to develop some kind of history. Mm -hmm. so the next question is about that topic. So what content other than things related to your career development do you recommend people share to their LinkedIn articles, videos, and, and so forth? Yeah, I think if, you, if you're someone that's good at writing, write some articles, show that you have, you know, you're a thought leader, you have ideas about things already. It doesn't have to be right or wrong, it just, Put some things out there if that's a strength of yours. Share content that's relevant to you that you're passionate about so that we get a sense of who you are and you know what you like, what you don't like, how you feel about certain things that are you know maybe commonly discussed today. Um, the other thing is recommendations. As often as you can get recommendations, those are huge. I did a bunch of uh, screening for a big fintech company recently. And when people were not active on LinkedIn, the hiring managers were a little like, mm, they're not really active. I don't know how I feel about that person. Mm -hmm. When I did it personally, I went straight down to recommendations. If I was on the fence from their resume, I would go down and look at what people had to say about how they worked. Yeah. And if they were like a bunch of glowing recommendations, then I would take a chance on the person, even though I was kind of on the fence with the resume. If there weren't, any, or there may be like one or two that didn't tell me that much, I would likely pass on them for someone with a stronger resume. So those can be make or break it uh, when it comes to your LinkedIn profile and activity. You know, I'm actually, I'm actually glad that you mentioned uh, the, the recommendations because I do encourage my students to, even like when they work on a project uh, with a group of students, I tell them, look guys, you know, if you're happy with 
one another, you know, write recommendations for each other on, uh, on LinkedIn. Yes. And I also tell them, you know, that when I look at recommendations, I always look at the, I call it the score sheet. You know, I mean, do they just receive recommendations or do they also give recommendations? And when I see someone who's got like, you know, five recommend, he was, he received five recommendations, but he, he gave zero. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. I don't like this kind of disbalance. Yes, I was going to, to tag onto that too and make sure that I clarified. Make sure you're also giving recommendations. That's important. And commenting on people's things. So, um, you know, like any other social network, the more that you are active and you like and you comment and you share, the more likely that your things are to be seen. So that's a benefit for you. But at the same time, you know, when I'm scrolling down your profile and I'm looking at your recent activity, it tells me something about you if I see that you've cheered someone's accomplishment over there as a way to go over here, you know, like you're involved in what your peers are doing. Um, that tells me a lot about you as well and shows me that you're likely going to get involved in my organization and be a good team support, right? So those things are important. So, but, so you would definitely agree that, uh, that they, should, they should post about things they are passionate about yeah, uh, and uh, probably create some kind of consistent theme so it's pretty clear what they like. If they're good yeah. in writing, post about writing. You know, if they are, if they enjoy design, maybe they can they can write short articles about design or share even the things that they create. Show your work, yeah. Good, absolutely. Okay, so uh, the next few questions are more about interviewing. Uh, so many of the students are currently interviewing or soon will be. So the first one is about. What is the top three mistakes people make okay. at their first big time interview? And I think when they say big time interview, it's like the one after college. <laughs> yes. So number one big mistake and one I did myself when I first started interviewing is not asking enough questions. Mm -hmm. So I had this theory in my mind and from speaking to your class in the past, David, I think that's something that a lot of college students still have, where if I ask too many questions, it's gonna come off like I'm uncertain or not confident, or if I don't ask questions, it's gonna come off like, no, nope, I'm good, I got this. You know, I have no questions, everything's good to go. And that's not the case. So I want, when I'm interviewing people and when I coach people in interviewing, I want to hear people asking good detailed questions to know that they're properly vetting my company and my position for them, right? The biggest cost of an organization is turnover. So make sure you're asking the right questions. You're understanding like, what does success look like? What, is, what are the top challenges facing this role? What is your culture like? You know, where is this, what's the growth potential of this role? What's the org chart look like in terms of structure? So you know what you're walking into, make sure it's a good fit for you. And then on the interviewer side, because you're the interviewee, I'm looking at it as, okay, they're really being thoughtful about this. They're asking really good questions. They're digging deeper. That's how they're going to approach their work most likely, right? They're not going to be like, yeah, I got it. Like, yeah, I want to understand further to make sure that I am clear on what the ask is and clear on how to move forward. So that's number one for sure. Um, the next is not having a good answer to the weaknesses question. So this is another one where we get a little skittish and try to skate over our weaknesses because we don't want to throw ourselves under the bus. And what ends up happening is we end up giving these like BS weaknesses like, oh, I'm a perfectionist, you know, like <laughs> that, is not, that doesn't tell me anything. And I can clearly see that you're trying to give me something that sounds good and is not really a weakness. Now, if you talk about a perfectionist being like, hey, I'm a perfectionist and why that's a weakness is because I tend to get too hung up on making sure things are perfect before delivering them. And I recognize in a work context, sometimes that can hinder me, right? Because I can't move as quickly if I'm so stuck on making sure it's perfect. I understand that sometimes I just need to get like minimum viable product out there and then come back and fine tune as I go. That would be a proper answer to a weakness question involving being a perfectionist, not just yeah. I'm a perfectionist. So you can always spin them in terms of understanding and recognizing verbally, like how it can impact you negatively at work, 
but what you're doing to work on it, or even that just you're aware of how it can negatively impact you at work shows me that you have self-awareness. And if you can't properly answer a weaknesses question and give me several like examples, uh, I'm thinking you're not very self-aware and that's not something I want in an employee. The third thing is, I think this is a tough one. There's so many things, but I think common for new grads, for example, is just getting so nervous that you end up being really stiff and you don't feel like you can show your personality. What I would say is the best thing you can do is show your personality, right? Because you need to make sure that you fit in and they need to make sure that you fit in. And even though 90% of it is about like making sure you can do the work, there's definitely like a team fit, culture fit factor that comes into play. And you're gonna feel more relaxed if you can feel like you can be yourself. Now, that doesn't mean you should be like dropping curse words in an interview or showing up like looking haphazard or anything like that. You still wanna be polished and professional, but I would encourage you to like breathe, take your time, recognize it as a two-way conversation. You're interviewing them, they're interviewing you. It's not you just trying to like put on your best face and impress them to the point that you get so nervous that you can't function. You know, this is this is so timely because last night we we had a meeting with uh, Mike Miller. He's a vice president at the Engine Group, mm. and we had exactly the same conversation with him. Uh, we were talking about how important that, that when they interview candidates, that they really look for the fit, and they cannot assess the fit unless the person is really genuine and authentic and they they simply don't try to be someone else they yes. really have to be true to themselves so they can actually assess uh, whether or not uh they would fit yeah. yeah and the authenticity comes through strong like i have people where because they're nervous they skate over examples of things and they deliver something that sounds great. And maybe to an untrained interviewer, it's like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I want to hear. But to someone that's trained like me, like I know that they're skating over it. And sometimes that comes from just nerves and being afraid to say the wrong thing. And so you end up not really saying much at all and not providing enough detail. And then I start guessing, well, are you just making this up? Like, did you not actually do those things? Because you're not being your authentic self. So authenticity is always better than trying to tell someone something that you think they want to hear. And I think you just touched on one topic that, that is probably not uh, on on the list of the questions, but I still want to mention it. That they, that, that when you said you know that sometimes they end up saying nothing, which mm -hmm. reminds me how important it is that they do learn how to answer those behavioral questions using really real examples that you know just yes. specific experience that is that can be related. Uh, to a given job position, even though it may come from a lower level job, you know, being a server or a bartender. But really answer the questions using specific examples. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so basically uh, the, the three top mistakes is not asking enough questions mm -hmm. and not being able to provide few good examples of weaknesses, but mm -hmm. always highlight that you are working on them. And of course, the last one, uh, be true to yourself. Yep. yep. So the next one, uh, what is the most overused, non-effective thing students say or do in interviews? So I think going back to the number one, asking the right questions and enough questions, the most overused, non-effective thing to say in an interview is like, what does the day-to-day -day look like? And I say that because you should have done your research and know what you're walking into. And if you, let's scoot down the line a couple of years, right? Like if you're in a career path, you know what the day-to-day -day involves. That's why they're hiring you because you've been doing something similar. So don't waste a question because those, those end up at the end of the interview time and you're already kind of rushed. Don't waste a question on that. You should already likely know what the day-to-day -day looks like, right? And most companies are gonna say like, every day is a little different. So it's kind of hard to give an effective answer to that too, without mapping out all the variations that could happen in a day. 
the other thing is if you're young, so let's backtrack to where you guys are. If you're young and walking into a career path, that's a perfectly valid question, just not for an interview. Have an informational interview ahead of time. So meet with someone in the company, in the role, do your due diligence to understand what the day-to-day -day looks like from people that are actually doing it every day before you get to the interview. When you're at the point of looking and accepting a job offer, you should be asking them those questions so that I come back to like, what does success look like? What are the top challenges? Where do I fit or not fit based on my skills and experience? Where are you looking to grow this position? How does it impact the bottom line of business objectives? Like, you should be having those key questions and conversations at the end of an interview, not what does the day-to-day -day look like, right? So do that ahead of time. Uh, that, that, that is an yeah, excellent point, and unfortunately, many students underestimate it, that they, they don't do enough research before the interview. And even more importantly, they don't take the effort uh, to really connect with someone uh, in a position that maybe they can see themselves few years down the road and really learn from them yeah. build those connections yep okay so i think the, this is still kind of related to interviewing uh but it, the, the topic is more about negotiations so uh in may i will be transitioning from an intern to a full-time solid associate my internship was one that was unique and brought a lot of value to the company i want to be sure my value is seen and i am compensated fairly in my next role how do i go about explaining why i believe i deserve more than the average entry-level salary without coming across as entitled? Mm, yeah, this is a really good question. So one thing I'll preface with is just be aware that there are typically, if this is a larger company where you're able to transition from an intern into full-time salary position, there are usually salary bands, right? So there's only so much they can do within that band. However, what you wanna aim for is to get to the top of that band, right? So when you say that you're asking for more than the average entry level salary, let's assume the average entry level salary is between 40 to 45. So they're probably not going to give you 47, right? It's not going to happen because that can cause a lot of problems mm -hmm. from like a, a big business perspective, um, especially in larger organizations. If it's a smaller organization, they might have more flex there. Because this one is large. I know it's, it's larger. It's a company like Pro. Yeah. So they're going to be pretty rigid about their, because they have to be consistent. There's just way too many employees and it can get really dicey internally mm -hmm. if people start figuring out that you're getting paid more than they do and you're doing the same work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but let's try to aim for that 45 instead of the 40. Okay. Now, what you do next is if you were an intern, you should have work to show and value and impact, right? You said that it was kind of a unique position that you were in and you brought a lot of value. So showcase that value in the conversation. Have some data, have some impact, bring it to the table and be able to say, here's what I accomplished in the last three months, five months, however long you're working there. I did this and this is the impact. I did this and this is the impact. Because of all the value that I was able to bring to this organization without, you know, a lot of structure and taking the initiative on myself, I know that I'll bring that same initiative and value into this next role. I believe that I should be compensated at, you know, around $45,000 a year. You can ask for it. Doesn't mean they're going to give it to you, but you can ask for it and you should ask for it. And I don't think you need to worry about coming across as entitled if you have the impact, mm -hmm. right? If you're coming in blind, then it's, and they don't know you out of a hole in the ground, like then it can come across a little entitled if you're like, I think I deserve this, right? So then you would approach that differently. So maybe that is not, this next piece is not necessarily an answer for this um, person, but for everybody else listening, you would want to come in and just say, hey, you know, because of X, Y, Z, here's what I'm looking at. I would like to be making here. Can you get me close to that number? Right. And you can throw out like a little bit higher ballpark, assuming they're going to come in a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. It's OK to ask for it and you should ask for it. You can do it in that way. It's a little bit softer. It's not as entitled, but it's like, hey, I would really like to be making this. This is kind of where I'm at in terms of um you know market value and what i'm seeing other companies offer and what i believe i bring to the table 
how close can you get me to that number, right? That way it's still leaving it open for a conversation mm -hmm. instead of just saying, I believe I expect this, right? That can rub people the wrong way a little bit. You know, I, I'm glad you mentioned it because I, I, I was about to ask, you know, not everybody will know what the band is, you know, is, is it 40 to 45 or what, what is that band? They may, they may not have any idea about it, but I think what you just said allows them to find out, to say, hey, you know, I would like to make this much. How close can you get me to that number? Uh, yeah. So I think that, 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 that's the important statement. How close can you get me to that number? So yeah. you allow them the, the flexibility. Yep. You know, uh, next one is actually, it's not on the list. I just received it uh, this morning, mm -hmm. but it's related to uh, negotiations. So okay. I have a meeting today at 1230 with HR manager at Angie to go over benefits and job offer. Do you have any advice? So I know that the, you know, in this case, Lindsay, she's interested in the same thing, you know, like the negotiation. So they're gonna present her the offer, they're gonna present her the salary and the benefits. Yeah. Uh, what would you tell Lindsay at this moment? One, I would say always negotiate, especially for women, this is statistically, tend to shy away from it because mm -hmm. we don't want to come off as like pushy or entitled or all those things always ask for it and if you ask for it in the way that i i showed you which is not you know overly aggressive but still like hey this is what i'm looking for what can you do and it's fair all they can say is no right but always negotiate always try to aim a little bit higher because they're likely going to come in a little bit underneath don't blow it out of the water though because that can also come across as like, <laughs> what is this person thinking, right? Like they're way overvaluing themselves. If you're coming in, you're like, no experience asking for, you know, 65, 70 grand, probably not going to happen. So try to do your due diligence again, like research ahead of time, what this company typically pays, you know, what is common for those size companies. You can't compare a small agency entry-level marketing position to a Kroger entry-level marketing. It's just not the same. They have a much bigger budget because they're a much bigger company. So you have to also compare and make sure that you have the information regarding like what's comparable for that size. If you're looking for a small agency feel, then the drawback is gonna be that they have less money to pay you, right? If you're looking for a big corporation, you get a lot more bureaucracy, you're competing against a lot more people and maybe there's more rigidity in your role, but you're gonna get paid a lot more and probably get better benefits. So it's a trade-off, know what you're working with and kind of market yourself in that window. So you're not way off the mark, um, but don't be afraid to ask mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to negotiate things like benefits too. Like if they, for example, if they can't match your salary that you're looking for, ask them if they have any flexibility on things like vacation or work from home policy or, you know, cell phone reimbursement or parking reimbursement or anything like that. Again, some companies will have the flexibility to throw those things in. Some may not. If they're larger and they have more structure to what they can and cannot negotiate on, maybe not. But it's worth the ask and it's worth seeing like what you can get out of the deal if they're offering you a job to begin with they really want you and they're already in a position of being willing to do what they can within reason to get you on board yeah that's good, that's good. thank you okay so uh we're gonna move on and uh, the next set of questions are more about job search in in general so the first one is what is your best or favorite piece of advice for someone who is starting their job search for their first post-graduation role yeah. I know the answer, Alex. Okay. They need to complete our dream job certification. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, though, that would solve all your problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would say get out there and just ask a bunch of people for help. You know, find whatever resources you can because your first job, not to put the pressure on, because it's not like you can't 
have your first job and realize it's not for you and go to something else. But that first job makes a big impact, right? And if you pick the right one and it's really geared towards what you want to do, you're saving time and you're just that much closer onto that dream job. So do your due diligence, do your research, talk to people, ask people for help, ask people for advice, join networking groups, you know, let people get to know you a little bit. Again, part of the challenge and, and what you know, we're aiming to solve with the career certification workbook and being certified is that it's a risk to hire new grads. Most of them don't really know quite what they want to do. With the certification, you're kind of giving them your seal of approval. Like I've done the research, I've done the digging, I know this is what I want and I'm a safer option, right? If you haven't done that yet, then do the research elsewhere, join networking groups, let people get to know you so that they feel more at ease with who they're hiring and can refer you. Hey, you know, I met Sally over here. She's been coming to the networking meetings. Um, she seems like a really great kid, really sharp, sorry, not kid, really great person, really sharp, you know, a go-getter. I think she'd be a great fit for your organization. A referral like that is going to put you at the top of the pile of anyone applying via LinkedIn, e Indeed, Career Builder. Right. So get out there. You guys are relatively unencumbered for the most part. Right. And like me and my crib behind me, it's a lot harder <laughs> to get out these days, but you're unencumbered. So, so get out, meet people, talk to people, tell them what you're looking for. Um, and don't be afraid for the ask, asking for help. Yeah. And I think that the, the next question almost like directly builds on this one. And I think you have already provided some some answer to it. Uh, it's about what would you recommend to students who are uncertain about what they want to do in their careers? Yeah, I, I get people 10, 20 years into their career that are coming to me because they just kind of got on a path and went down the path mm -hmm. and they didn't spend a lot of time digging deep up front to understand the answer to this question. Um, and so that's where I would say like, you know, not trying to self-promote, but like do the work of understanding what you want in your career. You could go hire another career coach for all I care. Like, I just want, I'm passionate about people really understanding their strengths and their interests and their passions and how to apply them to a job. So I don't care where you get the information from or who you talk to, but spend some time exploring what you're good at, what you like to do, talk to people in fields of interest to you, do those informational interviews. So on the basic level, just do that, you know, get a better idea. And then once you get into a role, start exploring the growth path of those roles and people in other companies that are doing something similar, because just because you're doing that type of role in one organization doesn't mean it's going to be the exact same across the board. There's different industries, different size companies might have different options of how to build upon that role you know i think that the yeah you know I, I, as i as you said you know i don't i don't want to self-promote but it, i often tell students like these you know that maybe you just haven't asked the right questions yourself yeah. you know, because you really have to you have to reflect a lot you have to learn about yourself what you're good at uh, what you enjoy doing because everyone has that knowledge already you just didn't ask the right questions and you didn't spend enough time to really understand who you are. And I think that the sooner they do it, the better. Because I think you made a point earlier that you can say, ah, oh, you know, I will not worry. I'll just take the first job. But that first job can set you back and it will take a much longer time to get where you could have been if you have done the research early on. Yes, and tagging onto that, two things that jump out is one, when you just take a job, it's easier to keep just taking jobs, right? Because you're instability and people in general don't like change. They don't like a lot of risk. So it's easy to just keep plugging along. When you take a job that you're really excited and passionate about, you're going to accelerate so much faster because you're naturally good at what you do and you love what you do. And when you're passionate about something, you're going to see success. People are going to want to rally around you and give you opportunities because they know you're going to hit it out of the park. The other thing is when you're on this path and just plugging along, let's say 10 years from now, you realize like, you know what? I finally reached my limit. Uh, this is not what I wanna do. I wanna be this over here. 
now you gotta go back down like remember shoots and ladders am i super old like aging myself here you gotta like go back down yep. to start you know and, and I'm, I'm having to help people and coach them through that process and sometimes they really do have to start over and be willing to take an entry-level job and when you're 40 and have a family and a mortgage and car payments and all those things it becomes a lot less realistic for you to have to go start from square one and be making a base level salary again so sometimes then you're stuck right or have to go back to school and start over so you're in prime position now to really do the exploration and make sure you're setting yourself up for success yep yeah, yeah, yeah. so the next well the next question kind of again kind of ties into the previous one so do you think it is important for everyone to strive to find their dream job? Or should people, especially recent grads, just start out in a place that is practical? Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a fair question. And I would say it's somewhere in between, right? Like, don't put the pressure on yourself to find your ideal dream job off the bat. It, it's probably not going to happen, mm -hmm. but you can narrow down the playing field a little bit, right? You can say like, hey, I'm passionate about like these three key things and I want to explore which one in reality actually fits my wants and my needs. And that's where the practicality comes in, right? Like these sound great on paper, but maybe once I'm in it and I'm looking at the growth path and the types of companies that have these roles, and you know what the pay actually looks like, what the hours look like, you know, is that something I want to be doing? If not, maybe I'll explore option two or three, you know? So that's where the practicality comes in. But I don't think you should just settle for anything because it's good pay and good mm -hmm. benefits, unless you absolutely have to. Like if you're totally unable to make your bills yeah maybe get a part-time job while you're looking for something you know to be able to make your bills like don't go starve on the street i'm not that impractical but at the same time you know you want to set yourself up to keep building it, if you remember i have a, a son who's a toddler and i now have an infant who's crawling she's nine months and he'll like build these blocks and then she comes over and she just like whacks them down and he gets so frustrated because he's just like worked on this whole thing that's basically what you're doing if you're not putting the thought and time and effort into yep. picking up these first jobs that you have right you're like building on all these things and then someone comes down and knocks them out and you're having to start from square one so find the in-between um of like being a dreamer and being practical it's usually somewhere in the middle yeah, and I think you made a great point at, at the beginning that, uh, you know, they are not very likely, you know, find their dream job right after college. But yeah. I think that if they do enough research and enough self-exploration, they can understand what the dream job could be maybe five or 10 years down the road and then create an action plan, you know, how do I get there? Yes. So I think that in this case, you know, I think this question was asked by Emily, but I'm not really sure. You know, she may just ask herself, you know, is the job I have right now, is it really preparing me for the dream job I think I could have five or 10 years down the road? And if the answer is yes, then go for it. Go for it and uh, enjoy it, learn from it, and then move on. But again, you cannot answer these questions unless you really ask those questions yourself. Sure, yeah. And the preparation is key. If you're just using skills that are not going to help you in that dream job, then why are you building those skills, right? But if you're strengthening those muscles that are already really organic for you that are going to, you know, be leveraged in that dream job down the road, like start building that strength now. Start building and practicing, usually and learning about yourself so that you're ready for that dream job down the road. That's actually a good point because basically you're saying that uh, you know if, if 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 you feel that the job allows you to practice what you enjoy, you're like, oh yeah, I, I like doing this. That again, that can help them to say, you know what, I will start with this job because I know I'll be doing what I love. I'll be developing it even more, and then you know, as a result, I will move forward uh, towards my dream job. Yeah. yeah. So the next one is, uh, do you think many companies steer away from college graduates just because they are new to the actual real world and hire people just because of the experience? Or do you think many employers would rather hire fresh college graduates? Mm, yeah, I think there is a strong bias against fresh college graduates. 
um, for the reasons we already spoke about, right? Like you're just risky. Most people don't spend the time and colleges don't adequately prepare people, unlike Dr. Raska. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Most co colleges do not adequately prepare people for the real world, how to apply everything they're learning and make sure that what they're actually studying is what they're great at and want to do. Um, so it's a huge risk for companies because I'd probably say 75% of the time people come in and their first job and they're like, this is not for me. Bye. You know? <laughs> so exactly. And it's a huge cost for companies. So we prefer you don't practice that on us, you know? Um, and so, yes, there's definitely a bias towards people with experience so that we are relieved to know that they have been in the role, they know what it entails, and they're good with it. They're okay with that. Yeah. You know, this is like completely off topic, but uh, I'm actually glad that we go through this because honestly, Alex, I, I'm now just realizing how important that workbook actually is. Yeah. I just realized, you know what? We're solving all these pain points. <laughs> exactly. Because if you if, if you do it, then, then, then you're starting with everything you need and you, you are reducing that risk. Uh, from the company perspective, because they, like you said, they will see, oh, you have done your homework. You already know what you're good at. You already know what you want to do. Great. So the risk goes down. Yeah. And then earlier, you also, when you were answering that question about the, the negotiation, uh, you also said, hey, bring that checklist of the things that, you know, what impact you have. You know, have that list of experiences that had impact maybe on your development or maybe impact on the company you work for. Because again, that's going to reduce the risk. But it's a project done in a class or volunteering experience or internship or a part-time job. It doesn't yeah. matter, but have that list because I think that will reduce the risk uh, in the Absolutely. eyes of the employers. And it's a negotiation tool. It's, it's a powerful statement to say in, say in an interview, look, I've worked with a career coach. I have done my due diligence of understanding exactly what I'm good at, what I want to, how I want to use it, and this company is exactly what I need, exactly what I want. Like that's really powerful to an employer. Like, wow, okay, they're certain, right? So that gives me way more confidence to select you and you're coming across passionate about what you'd be doing for me. Passion you can't create, like it's not artificial. Like it has to come from within someone. So in, an, in a negotiation for an offer, again, bring it up. Look, I have done unlike my peers most of my peers out here like i worked with a career coach i've done my due diligence i know this is exactly what i want i know that these are the things that i'm good at i know that this is how i'm going to apply it in this role and you are not going to be disappointed mm -hmm. right like that confidence of being able to say it and come across is going to help tip the scales in your favor so you know this this is a this question is not on the list but it just came to my mind so Let's say someone goes into the interview process. He, he or she has done all the homework. She mm -hmm. worked with the career coach and they really know what they want. And as they go through the various interviews, uh, it's gonna come out. So, and then, then finally they get, they, they get to the point of the job offer and negotiation. Do you have any idea, Alex, if we really, really like the candidate, if we are like, oh my gosh, we really need this person, would that impact our offer? You, you remember you said the band, 40 to 45. Is it like more likely we're gonna pitch the higher band or are we still gonna start with the lower one? No, absolutely, it impacts it. So I will say, cause I, I work with companies quite a bit. Um, most companies make the mistake of hiring someone that they're not 100% sold on because it's just too painful to keep going without someone, right? Or they're not finding that one person. So they're like, mm, we'll take a chance on this person. Let's offer them kind of the lower end of the range because we're not 100% sold. Now that doesn't mean that person's bad. Like sometimes you end up getting great hires out of that. It's just maybe they didn't interview well or come across in a certain way in the interview. But we know from all the research that like you want to wait and hire a players so when you find those a players that you are excited about you're more willing to go in 
at the mm-hmm. high end because you're not wanting to play around, right? Like, you know that new grads, for example, you see a lot of them and most of them don't have great interview skills. Most of them haven't done the due diligence of understanding what they want in a career. So the big risk stamp across their forehead, right? You do find those few that are just really on point and they come across professional and polished and mature and they know what they want and they're like, boom, on it. You want to give them a high offer because you know that they're probably having multiple author offers coming their way. You're not going to waste time putzing around with negotiations over a few thousand dollars. It's not going to happen. So a few thousand dollars to a new grad is a, a big difference. A few thousand dollars to a company, peanuts, mm-hmm. right? So yes, that's a very good point. They're likely going to come in at the higher end and not not waste time playing around with that because it's not worth the risk for them. Yeah. Yeah, good, good. Okay, so the next one, uh, still about job search. Uh, as someone who is currently applying to jobs, do you think it would be beneficial to apply to jobs across the US instead of just my local area? A thousand percent. If you're willing to relocate, don't just do it and then hope that they're not going to relocate you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um especially right now, because companies are more open to the hybrid model of remote work. But some companies still, after a a year of toiling through and lumbering through remote work, realize the value of in-person work. And I'm I'm of the camp of, I think both are really really valuable. It depends on the person and how they work best. Um, But I do think there is value to having some in-person work. And so if you're across the country, you know, the likelihood of them being willing to fly you out if that's what they want is is a cost they might not want to absorb. So um, be willing to relocate. If you if you are, if you're open, um, definitely do it. You'll open up your opportunities quite a bit. If not, don't, because nothing's worse than a company getting you through the process and then you pulling, you know, pulling a fast one on them at the last minute and saying like, yeah, but I'm I'm not really willing to relocate. That's going to put a really bad taste in their mouth and probably kill the deal right there. Yeah, and I think that you know what, what, what you also kind of suggested in between the lines is that you know when you are considering applying for jobs elsewhere, it does help from my personal perspective to find locations that you actually enjoy, you like, and you can imagine yourself living there. So we just had Hannah who just moved to Salt Lake City because she loves that environment. Yeah. Uh, so she had a reason to you know to go there. I remember when I was interviewing for NKU uh, job, I remember that they did ask me, so David, why did you pick NKU? Because I could go anywhere in the United States. And I know I answered them, well, uh, that is Red River Gorge, you know, and I love climbing. Uh, So I know that uh, I will be close to a place that is dear to my heart. And I know this was one of the reasons why they decided to hire me because they knew I would be happy there, that Mm -hmm. I I would feel fulfilled. So I think it does help when you have a location that you actually enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. That helps. Now on the flip side, I think there's a lot of places that you wouldn't expect to enjoy, you know, so be open-minded because like I moved to Cincinnati from New York city. Why? (laughs) You know, but I love it here. I love it. I've been here for almost 10 years and I love it. I'm like a huge fan of Cincinnati. I tell everyone about it. Same thing with um, my husband had a potential opportunity with PNG to relocate to, um, their Walmart location, which now the actual city's escaping me, but I think it's like Nebraska, you know, like it's, it's somewhere way out there. And apparently it's a really cool city. Um, I spoke to someone that worked on Walmart for PNG like 10 years ago. And she's like, it's amazing. I loved it there. And now she's in Miami, right? So like comparing the two, you would never imagine that she yep. would have great things to say, but sometimes random cities surprise you. So, you know, Maybe if you're really excited about the company, spend the time to fly out for a weekend and explore it and make sure it's the right fit for you. Or let them know up front, hey, I I don't know how I feel about relocating yet, um, but is is there potential for remote work for this position? And I I would just ask them up front so you're not wasting their time and they're not wasting yours. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the last question related to job search is, what is your best advice to someone who is about to graduate and having a hard time finding a job? Hmm. 
we need to analyze at, at what point you're having a hard time finding a job because that likely showcases where you need some help. Um, and that's why some people when they come to me for career coaching and help finding a job, I have people different stages of the journey. There's some people that are like, I'm not even getting responses to my resume. Well, then maybe you're either not networking enough or your resume is not great, you know? Um, or I have people that come to me and say, I'm getting interviews, but I'm not getting any job offers. Well, then you probably need some interview coaching because maybe you're okay, you know, good enough to get through the interview, but you're not giving them the wow factor that makes someone be like, yes, we have to have that guy. So, you know, analyze where you're struggling and that's likely where you need, that's the indicator of where you need some help and some extra support and then go find the help, you know? Yeah, you know, I, think I, I agree. You know, this is really hard to answer because you don't really know what the person is doing, what type of search they're doing, uh, what their resume looks like, what their cover letter looks like, what their LinkedIn right. profile looks like. Yep, but I but I also glad you mentioned the, the networking part that uh, which I think that many students really underestimate. They're still kind of too afraid to do it and uh, really reach out and start building those connections, especially in the companies they can imagine themselves, uh, you know, working. Yes, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more in this networking question coming up. Okay, so the next one is about uh, more like maybe in a later in career regarding late uh, career progress. At what point do you think enough is enough? When do you start looking other ways? Mm -hmm. Now, I hope I'm interpreting this correctly, but I'm assuming this is someone saying enough is enough with their current job. Yes, that's that, that's my guess. That uh, very likely they they are with the company maybe for a year or two, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe right now they may feel like, hmm, should I look elsewhere or should I talk to someone within the company? What should I do? How do I know I should do something? Yeah, well, and this this is really challenging because it really depends on the situation. Um, if it's, for example, something within the company or the boss, then you want to try and, whereas everything else in the job you like, then you want to try and address the problem. And I know when you're young in your career, even now for me, like it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to kind of bring up those tough conversations and be honest and candid about like, look, this isn't working for me. Um, but if everything else is going great, then it's worth having that conversation versus jumping ship because maybe you can resolve it, you know, and things will get better. Um, or maybe you can have a trusted mentor within the company and they can move you to a different position uh, where you're, you know, still growing your, your strengths and your capabilities and you're not having to totally leave. Um, if it's something where you're like, everything about this job is just not the right fit, then listen to that. I think I read a statistic recently where like 80% of people are disengaged in their jobs, but don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't be that person. Um, <laughs> and I, I say that genuinely because I, I equate when I coach and when I speak on topics at conferences or write things, I use two analogies quite often because I think they are something that everyone can relate to in parallel really well. I use relationships and I use like parenting. So I'll bring this back to the relationship analogy, right? The longer you stay in a bad relationship, the more damage it does to you. And when you do finally come out of it, you've got like a lot of issues you have to work through and your confidence is completely shot. And, you know, you don't have the energy to tackle life or all these normal things. You've kind of lost joy in things. Don't, that happens with jobs too. We put so much value in ourselves at work that when you get to the point of being frustrated and disengaged, you're probably going to end up burning the bridge. Um, your work is going to suffer because you're not excited about what you're doing. You don't feel valued, whatever the reason is, right? Then you're probably not impressing your peers anymore. That could be great references for you down the road. Your confidence is going to be shot by the time you get out because, you know, you're in an environment where you're not appreciated or valued, like, and all of these things carry with you into your job search process. And if you don't think those things come through in the way that you interact with people and you're interviewing, they absolutely do. So don't let the baggage pile up from staying in something too long that's no longer serving you. Thank you. Goodbye. Moving on.
Yeah, but but as you said early, er, earlier, you definitely recommend that you know if you feel that the job is like you know I enjoy what I do, but it's just like one thing that I I just struggle with talk talk about it with your manager with the people in the company and see what's gonna happen. And if nothing and not happens, then maybe look elsewhere. Yeah. And not just once, right? Like again, relationship parallel. If you have a problem, you're not going to be like, peace, I'm done. Yeah. Right. You're going to talk about it and see if it can be fixed. And just because you bring it up one time, doesn't mean like all of a sudden the person's going to start doing what you want them to do. Like it takes a while for change to happen. And it's not always top of mind for the, your manager all the time. They're really busy, pulled in a lot of different directions. So keep bringing it up. And if they can show that they're working towards it, then be patient, right? And if they clearly are not doing anything, well, that's probably your sign that they're not that interested in helping you out, you know? You know, Alex, this is an excellent point, you know, about first being patient and secondly, uh, really be able to put yourself into the shoes of the other person and realize that they're busy. They, they have to, they're responsible for X and Y and you are one of the 100 responsibilities they may have. And yeah. I think we often forget to do that. We think, oh, I just sent him the email and he's not responding, why? Well, because yeah. he very likely has 100 other emails uh, with higher priority <laughs> than yes. this one. Yep. And for this generation, I would pause there and really going back to the self-awareness piece, we are conditioned to have everything like this, yeah. right? Like when I was, Growing up, I had a gateway computer with the dial up into the AIM chat room that took five minutes. Can you imagine waiting five minutes for a website to load? Like now I wait for it to load and if it takes more than five seconds, I'm like, what is going on? You know, <laughs> we're conditioned for everything to happen like this. And you have to be able to think, and this is, this is a skill that I encourage all of you to develop because it's, it's a leadership skill and it, it's going to play into business acumen as you grow. You need to think big picture. Like if I'm running this organization, how would this impact it, right? Like if I'm running this organization and I have this great employee that's not working out in this position, but they have all these great skills and I would love to be able to put them in this position, but this position doesn't quite exist yet. I need to come up with a value case for it and I need to figure out how to pay for it. That's not gonna happen in two weeks. Right? That might be six months or a year. So if everything else is going well, like weigh whether it's worth being patient enough. And as long as you know they're working towards it, just be aware that that itch might be just conditioning of having things happen for you right away. It's not realistic. It takes time. There has to be a business case for things. And if they value you, they'll be working towards it and they'll keep you in communication. Yep, yep, yep. Patience, patience, patience. That's real. Okay, so uh, we're going to move to the last questions about networking. Uh, so the first one is, what is your number one tip for networking? I got this tip from someone else when I first started my business that I think is like one of the best, most simple tips. And it's simply like, define your circle of influence. So you're going to meet a lot of people that could help you, right? But those key people should be people that have shown up for you before or are putting effort into the relationship or are calling upon, you know, the same types of customers that you would be looking for. So maybe peers that would be getting into the same types of companies that you would be looking for, right? So that if they get in, they can say like, hey, I want to refer my buddy over here. They're great. I can speak to their work. Right. So figure out who your circle of influence is. And it might be seven to 10 people. That way you're not trying to spread yourself too thin, keeping a relationship with 30 people. You're really staying top of mind with those seven to 10 that can are willing to and can provide you much more um, targeted leads into what you're looking for, if that makes sense. So and, uh, and I guess, you know, if I'm interpreting this correctly, uh, so I really like this idea of the circle of influence, that you have a little tribe of people that can help you continue growing, that they can help you, that they can be your mentors or advisors. You're talking about people out, most likely outside of the family, right? Yeah, because, you know, some people would say, yes. oh, you know, I have my dad, I have my mom, but that's like a very limited scope. It's just like, you know, I grew up in that environment. I want to go beyond that 
and maybe reach to people who work in companies that maybe I can see myself. Yes, absolutely. Because we're looking through the lens of like business and networking, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if your dad or your brother works at a company that you want to get into, then sure, it can be in there. But if not, then they're not really relevant for the circle of influence for networking. So make sure that it's people that can help you achieve your goal. Yep. Good. The, the, the next one uh, and the last one is, have you noticed any ages or people in specific places of their life that struggle with the feelings of not knowing what their purpose is or feel that there is something missing in their career. So I want to make sure I'm interpreting this correctly because my initial answer is yes, of course. Like every time people come to me for the most part it's because they're struggling with this. Um, they don't really know their purpose. They feel like something's missing and they don't know what that is and they need help kind of digging deep to find it. But I'm just, touching on having those any ages people in specific places of their life so i'm assuming that's really what you want answered is like is there a correlation between um M maybe you know i think that yeah if you see like uh, maybe the people who come come to you uh I, I agree with you that most of them come to you because they know something is missing something right. is missing they need to do something about it and maybe don't they, they they don't even know what their purpose actually is in the first yes. place I would say it usually happens at two places the most. And one is people early in their career, like a couple of years in. And the other is about 10 to 15 years in, like mm -hmm. halfway through their career. And they're just kind of tired of not really loving what they're doing um, and putting in all the hours. So, but the first one's interesting because I really think that those people early on in their career have known since they've graduated that they don't really know what they want to do. The thing that I noticed about young grads is that they, they think they know it and they don't want to ask for help. They, they are smart. They're capable. They are like aficionados of the internet and technology. And there's so much information at our fingertips that they assume, you know what? I got this. I can, I can figure it out. I have so much information, a plethora of resources. I can figure it out on my own. And so they get a couple of years in and they realize they haven't been able to figure it out on their own. And there are some things that you really just need help with. Like it's just too much. It's too complex. And you need people that are really skilled in that area to help you reach, you know, the results that you want to reach. Yeah. And I think I would say it goes back to the to your original idea of the circle of influence. You know, it's really, it's, it's the people you surround yourself with. Yeah. Uh, because they can really help you not only find your own purpose, but they can help you guide in, a, in these, you know, confusing uh, moments. Yeah. Good. Okay, Alex, uh, that's it. The, the last one, it's more personal. So it's about what is something that motivates you uh, besides your job, family, and doing what you're doing with us? <laughs> yeah. Um, motivates me. Besides my job, my family, too. well, I, I think I think there's one overarching theme with all of them, and it's that I like to um, I like to nurture potential. I really do. I get so excited about that. And and I don't know if you guys know, but I used to dance professionally, and I still teach salsa. I run a salsa dance company with my husband. So, you know, I these through lines come through with like raising kids. Like I'm fascinated about the fact that my two kids are so different how do I nurture their, their uniqueness as much as I can and let them thrive. Like when I work with people in career transition, you know, how do we pick apart what makes you unique and match you up with the right company where you're going to succeed? When I work with companies, how do we really market what makes you a great company to work for or get you to the place where you are a great company to work for so you can find great talent that's going to help you grow? Like, Everything for me is about nurturing potential and helping people see success and see happiness in their in their life and feel balanced and fulfilled. I, I think that's definitely what motivates me beyond just those specific key areas. Yeah, and I think you just nailed it because basically you just expressed your own purpose. You know, what is your purpose? You know, it's nurturing potential. So I think it's a kind of good way to close you know, this, this interview, because the message is, hey, once you know what your purpose is, 
then your life is fulfilling. And it doesn't matter if it's work or life after work, it, it's all kind of blends together. And I absolutely agree, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's the same thing. You know, I, I got lucky enough that I found this job and I, I absolutely love it. And now I realize that I want to help other people to, yeah. to be able to have the same thing. And it doesn't mean that they have to have a job at a high salary. It's more about having a fulfilling job and simply, you know, having a good life. And you decide yeah. what that good life means. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, Alex. Perfect. Uh, so thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. We even made it in one hour. That's pretty awesome. Right. That's impressive. <laughs> so no, Alex, really, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will share this with my students. I also told them that they, if they want to connect with you over LinkedIn, that they can, uh, yeah. so they can make you part of the of their network. And if they have any, you know, questions or maybe interest in using career coaching services, that they can definitely get in touch with you. Sure, of course, absolutely. Yep. Perfect. Good. Thanks a lot, Alex. You're welcome. Take care. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, and I'll see I you when I see you. Okay. Bye. 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 -bye.